George O'Farrell, I'm the facilitator this morning. Um, I'm extremely pleased to be here because I've just facilitated another session on the world coming to, to an end. Um, and so it's good to know that we've got a couple of architects who are going to save the world for us. Um, Dr James Davidson and Dr Ian Ware are both academic and practising architects, which is good, and they're straining to bring some research rigour to the practice of architecture. Um, James Davidson is the Queensland Director of Emergency Architects Australia and recently coordinated an extensive study of flood-damaged houses throughout South East Queensland following the floods. Um, and as well in far north Queensland following Cyclone Yasi. There were something like more than 300 volunteer architects and students involved in this, um, and the team offered free advice on how to restore homes, including cleaning repairs, drying out, and so forth. Um, <coughs> Dr Ian Weir is one of Australia's few bushfire architects. I don't think he designs bushfires, but what he does do um, is explore a sort of ground-up uh, view or approach to bushfire where landscape building design and habitation patterns are orchestrated to respond to site-specific fire characteristics. Um, that research is developed through the, universe of the Queensland University of Technology and through built works in Western Australia in the fire-prone forests and heathlands. Now, during the session, James and Ian are going to talk separately uh, and then together, uh, and then we'll have about 15 minutes at the end of proceedings for you to ask some questions. So. Make them up as you go along. Um, I'm hoping not to have to ask any at all. So <laughs> without further ado, ado, can I introduce James Davidson and Ian Weir? Thanks a lot, George. I'm Ian. This is James. I'm going to talk for 15 minutes, primarily on bushfire architecture. James will then talk about uh, his work with the floods. And then we'll bring it together um, with a project that we worked on together, which was uh, a competition where we actually looked at fire, floods and cyclones. And we've known each other socially for a couple of years, um, but uh, when we got together to work on this competition, we realised there was these incredible synergies uh, between what James had found in his research with floods and what I'd been doing in bushfire. And so we had quite a revelation, and it was at that moment that we were working on that competition we were invited to, to uh, give this talk, so it was quite fortuitous. Effectively, we want to focus on what the question is, can architects actually future-proof us against these e extreme events? And um, we believe architects have got a special role to play. Presently, you might be surprised that architects only design about 3% of all houses in Australia. It's just such an infinitesimal amount. So really what uh, these events, these extreme events do is they present architects with an opportunity to, to explore completely different solutions. So whilst some of us might think, okay, why do we even live in some of these landscapes that present these extreme risks, we don't ask that question. We look at those landscapes where people are already living or where they want to live and go, how can we actually look at a completely different typology of architecture, a completely different form of, of architecture? So that's our kind of um, position, if you like, um, that architects not only can help um, society, but also we can um, further the profession of architecture through engaging in this, in this form of research. So that's, uh, that's us in a, in a kind of nutshell, that's our position. So bushfire, this is a house um, I designed on the, um, the west coast of Australia. And um, it uh, actually was begun as an exercise in creating proximity between the residents of this house and their biodiverse landscape. The question was how to, to, to get those really intimately linked, not only physically, but also in a performance sense. How could they actually learn a lot about their extraordinary landscape through the vehicle of architecture? And in doing that, um, I had to look at bushfire as being one of the main factors. So I think James will agree with me that a lot of what we're doing is, is not answering all the questions related to floods, fire and cyclones, but prioritising them um, in a much higher level to what they would otherwise be done when you're designing a house, because obviously there's a whole lot of other issues that you're dealing with as a, as a building designer. So this is pushing bushfire up to the highest level. Well, not the highest level, because it was actually biodiversity in this instance which was the highest level. So this is the kind of biodiverse landscape we're talking about. So for me, we can't talk about bushfires without talking about the actual landscapes that present um, this situation of bushfires, this extreme, um, these extreme climatic events. So it's an ex extraordinarily beautiful landscape, and I think that's another thing that we want to get across today, is that architects not only design things that might look good, 
We also understand the way people behave, and that's where we can do much more than just science and technology approaches to these issues. Um, but we also understand that there's a whole aesthetic dimension to this as well. Um, just the, through architecture, creating different form actually challenges our sense of aesthetics, not only of landscape, but, but architecture itself. This is the most biodiverse landscape in Australia, um, botanically, uh, where I work in, in the West Coast WA. I work here, obviously, as an academic at, uh, in Queensland, but all my practice as an architect is back there. So, um, and uh, a little uh, peninsula on the, on the West Coast. And this is the kind of work I've done in my research, looking at different ways of representing this vegetation. The vegetation is just such an extraordinary thing and it's so important to my research. So I don't want to talk about what all these represent because we don't have the time for that, but they're new forms of representation of that, that biodiverse landscape. And it's led me to run a few design studios at QUT with this premise, bushfire, rather than thinking of it as a catalyst for fear, which is essentially what I guess we feel once we look at a lot of media um, reports and so on, but thinking about it as a catalyst for creativity because as architects, that's really, as I said at the beginning, the opportunity for us. Now, of course, there is, re you know, people actually die in these events and buildings burn down. And, um, it, you know, James and I both actually dealt with people that are suffering, suffering these traumas. So whilst we might say, yes, this is a really interesting, exciting, creative opportunity, you know, there's a whole lot of gravitas associated with it as well. These are some clients of mine um, down in Murrindindi in uh, Victoria. These photographs are taken straight out of after Black Saturday. Um, and then back in the West Coast, um, a national park that suffers fire all the time through lightning strikes. But nevertheless, there is a really in interesting aesthetic dimension. And it sounds a little bit um, uh, sort of, um, uh, what's the word, parasitic. But straight after Black Saturday, there were photographic tours organised to go and photograph all these ruins because they were incredibly photogenic. Um, so I just want to get across that there's much more to this than just the science and technology aspect. As architects, we deal with you know, a broader, <coughs> broader sort of scope. This is the reality check of these landscapes that um, the... Uh, just need to get the time again on this. There we go. That uh, you have a little house and you have a massive fire and uh, people die, houses get burnt down. This is the vegetation that uh, I showed in those earlier photos, which is this very low lying. So there's a simple equation of vegetation, fire is generally about three times the height of the vegetation you start with. So there's that reality check. Um, I'm also working on the east coast here, and this is principally with students from QUT, architects and landscape architects and so on, um, because uh, it's not well known around Australia, but you know, even in the subtropics here in southeast Queensland, there's a lot of um, you know, bushfire prone landscapes, particularly on these ridge top, um, high, heavily wooded um, landscapes inland from the, from the Gold Coast. So a little bit back to this house. There's some basic principles that are going to lead on to James's talk and then the project we worked on together, um, which um, you have to deal with when you're addressing bushfire. And embers, most houses are burnt down through ember attacks. So you need a, a really, a really um, resilient envelope to prevent embers actually getting into the house. And not, so it's not a bushfire that burns down houses. In most instances, or in pretty much all instances, houses are actually burnt down by house fires rather than bushfires, because a bushfire doesn't have to be anywhere near this house for it to, be, to burn down during that event. So embers can be transported for 20 kilometres, for example, and this house, if it wasn't designed like this, might go up. So, um, so a very interesting kind of uh, proposition for architects, how do you minimise the complexity of an envelope? Really simple structures. If you're eliminating all sorts of conventional verandas and eaves, then you've got to control the sun. So the sun is controlled on this house with the bushfire, bushfire shutters. So there's a synergy there straight away. Energy efficiency costs a lot to get five-star energy rating. Bushfire safety costs a lot to get that. You put the two together and you've got a synergy cost-wise. You get a really interesting kind of aesthetic um, um, angle that you're, you're going for, a really simple envelope, but you deal with the other issues to do with sun control and so on with the fire shutters. You also use lots of other things like um, roofs that don't have any uh, cavities within in them. We'll talk a little bit about that with regards to floods. Uh, and then other features which have been engineered, like bushfire uh, resilient glazing, which is what we're seeing here in this photo. You can see in this photo this proximity, this physical proximity that I was trying to achieve between the, the vegetation and the inhabitants of the inside of the house. The other feature of this house is this fire safe zone, which again we'll talk about with regard to the competition we worked on. A two hour fire compartment within the house, so you don't have to escape from the house to a bunker which has actually got a lot of, uh, it's incredibly problematic because as you're running between the house and the bunker, realising that you left the dog behind, then realising that you left the photos behind, left the wife behind or whatever, 
um, then uh, you know it's that moment that you're you're going to get caught in that extreme event. So you need these fire safe zones, these disaster proof zones, to be part of the of the the, um, the structure of the main house because you're going to retreat back to that house. You don't want to then retreat back out into the landscape that's presenting this threat and then to the bunker or whatever it might be. So other features are uh, yeah just not enabling um, embers to be deposited, so minimising cavities that you can't get to. Um, so rather than conventional roof forms, which might be pitched with a ceiling underneath it, eliminating all of that volume that you can't normally access, whether it's a flood or a fire. In this instance, what we're looking at is a completely fire-sealed floor um, structure. So the house is elevated above the ground, which is an interesting... A lot of people think, well, if you elevate above the ground, it's less safe than being on the ground, but we'll show in a minute that this is actually safer in bushfires because it reduces the... Um, the um, differentiation between negative and positive pressures. So as architects, we're looking at all this research that's being done um, by the CSIRO, bushfire CRCs and so on, and putting all that together into, into you know, one, one thing. So again, biodiversity and, and bushfire. So these shutters are pretty much the only shutters in Australia at this time, which was three years ago, that were actually rated for bushfires. And uh, you can see that they're, they're completely visually well, not completely. They're transparent when you're on the inside, but they're very opaque from the outside. And uh, in this instance, this, as I said at the start, there's many priorities, many things that you're actually addressing as, a, as an architect. This, this is uh, virtually like a plague of insects almost every day of the year, this landscape. Bull ants, um, March flies, mosquitoes, blowflies, completely different to Queensland. Can't believe how easy it is to live here. Um, incredibly windy, so it's almost an extreme event you know, for six months of the year as well. So these shutters take a lot of wind en energy out of the building. And, of course, they're, they're keeping the embers out and they're reducing the radiant heat and flame contact that's going to, um, going to damage the glazing. So, again, um, the, these shutters were sourced before I started designing the building. Found the shutters and then designed the building around them. Um, normally, they're an add-on. So it's, it's, the, it's the, I guess, the angle of art that you're getting from this. This is a holistic approach right from the ground up, looking at everything. Um, rather than designing a house and just adding things onto it because that really does nothing. It might do something for the clients, but we're architects, we're trying to further our discipline of architecture um, by, by challenging those kind of conventions. You end up with a brutal kind of aesthetic. You know, this is not to everybody's taste. The locals call this the $500,000 shed. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I'm sort of a bit taken aback by this because it's actually $700,000, but um, <laughs> the, um, yeah, so it, it's a very brutal um, aesthetic. Um, but I do spend quite a bit of time in this house with the clients and so it's great to get that sort of post-occupancy feedback and uh, I'm surprised how comfortable it is. That's actually the northern face that we're looking at on this side here. And so there's absolutely no sh sun shielding into those bedrooms there other than the fire shutters and they're the most comfortable rooms in the house. So, um, so we're looking at this cultural shift, a new typology of architecture for bushfire prone landscapes. And uh, it's a catchphrase, you know, we're trying to cut through. So fighting fire with design rather than all the other ways that you might do it, planning, um, science, um, and so on. So looking primarily, because we're architects, at design. So I'll just wrap up now. I've just got uh, coming to the end of my 15-minute segment. Um, other houses I'm working on. So a completely different type of landscape. Also on the west coast of WA, this area, and right down the bottom there. Um, on the very southern end of WA. So forested, this is really close, about 10 k's from the treetop walk in the Tingle Forest. You might have seen that. Um, and, uh, you know, the premise here is that we keep all the trees. So incredibly, um, it, this is the same kind of landscape as Black Saturday landscapes, Murrumbindi and so on. So if you get um, trees catching a light here, that'll just set the house alight. That house would go up in five minutes, uh, probably quicker, just from radiant heat alone. So, um, so we're demolishing this house and, and building, building something more like this. And I just lodged the uh, application for this um, two days ago. So this house actually, this is a house for Black Saturday and the house I've just shown you has this two-hour fire compartment. The same um, uh, approach that's used in high-rise buildings. You get people in a 50-storey building to the two-hour fire compartment so from there they can be rescued by fire um, trucks with ladders and so on. You don't get the people out of the buildings. You keep them in the building in this two-hour fire compartment. This house will be designed so that the house can burn down 
and people can survive in the next year of fire containment. Because you don't want to be in a house that's burning and a landscape that's burning at the same time. So the idea is that the house might take two hours to burn, but you can escape out of the house and the landscape, the threat would have already gone in the, in the landscape. And this is uh, some of the projects I'm working on at the moment. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ian. Um, thank you all for coming. So um, I'm actually the Queensland Director of Emergency Architects Australia and um, when the floods actually happened, um, our um, office got evacuated and so it became quite a personal thing. Also, um, uh, it was important for us to, well for me personally, to get involved in, in the flood relief um, and how we were able to design the program was around, my sister actually lost her house in the Black Saturday um, bushfires and one of the things that's come out of that um, since that time was that the, the most affected people were the uninsured, um, and even though there were uh, fun, there was funding available from the Victoria Relief um, funds and things like that, there's still a lot of people in those communities that have been badly affected. So, um, as in terms of this this action for the floods, um, uh, we thought it was best to actually approach working with uninsured people. Um, in the end, we ended up working for people who had insurance pending claims because there just became a mountain of people out there who actually weren't aware if they actually were insured or not. And we've recently had a spike in our assessments um, when people have now found out that they're not insured. So um, anyway, I'll just continue on. Also, we'll come back at the end and if anybody's keen to kind of talk about any of these slides, then we'll just keep going back through it if you like. Um, the process was basically, uh, we would send out registered architects with a team of two students uh, into ha homes that had been affected by the floods. Um, the, the whole point of the process in the beginning, and this is what we were talking about originally, that Ian <coughs> mentioned in the beginning about bringing in a kind of a, a research rigour to the action of architects, um, and that's something that I'm quite um, uh, adamant about in terms of it's... So the whole system of the assessment process was designed around Okay, it's not only to help the homeowner, but it's also to inform uh, possibly government at the end of the day. So the assessment forms that we used ended up being about nine pages long, and we recorded a bunch of information, which I'll present as we go. We found that um, actually a lot of people were surprised that architects were actually getting involved in, uh, in community actions like this. Um, most of the people that we were working with could never have afforded an architect. Um, and so we ended up sort of a lot of the time sitting down, having a cup of tea, um, talking to people about the process of rebuilding, what needed to be done. We had moisture meters, so uh, we could give them immediate advice on, well, don't, don't resheet. If you, if you can wait a little bit longer, then we recommend that. Um, and so it was quite a good process. And I do would, I wish to thank all those, the architects that actually did help. Uh, a lot of sole practitioners helped, and then a number of the big firms in, in town helped as well. As well as um, we had engineers that came in after our assessments uh, to the main to sort of inform the main structural problems with these houses, if there were any. Um, these were the communities, oh, the suburbs actually, that we, we worked in. Um, so you can see the Brisbane CBDs up the top there, top right, and then Ipswich CBDs down the bottom left. And you can see which, which communities were affected. And these were the numbers. So we ended up doing over 200 assessments. Um, we've had, uh, I think it's around about 100 students and then um, 50 odd architects. Um, we were, we've touched, I think we've worked out about 5,000 people through community workshops. Um, we've linked in with the Zuchi Buddhist Foundation who have been very, very good on the ground at um, organising community information sessions and things like that. And so in these communities here, you can see um, in the suburbs, sorry, the, the darker the colour, blue, the more assessments we had. So for instance, in Goodna, we ended up with a quarter of our assessments uh, in Goodner alone. Um, and these are the sorts of things that we were confronted with um, as we went. Simple, obvious damage. Um, and then internally, a lot, of, uh, a lot of the houses had been cleaned out, but many had not. Um, because people were unsure whether they should clean, because the insurance assessors were supposed to be coming back through if their claims were pending. And so there were a lot of people caught in this situation where do we clean, do we remove, do we strip? Um, because how are they gonna know how much to actually in insure us by? And this has happened on a couple of projects of mine in the office where the clients have been evaluated higher through the assessors, but when the builder's claims have come back in, 
um, and they'd cleaned everything out, the builders went lower than the insurance assessor had actually assessed, um, primarily because there was no evidence of what was there before. Um, so that's been a big problem. So I'll just quickly go through this. Um, sorry, I'll keep an eye on the time. Um, the majority you can see here, so these are the numbers of properties that we looked at. So more than 80 out of the 200 properties that were, were done um, were slab on ground brick veneer and then about 60 odd were elevated timber frame and cladding. And this became the kind of theme through the actual um, assessment process, this, this kind of um, uh, um, this difference between slab on ground and, and elevated timber Queenslanders and things like that. So, um, and this is where the lower slide, the lower image is there, that's in Goodna, um, a, a series of townhouses that we spent a quite a deal of time helping the owners because the situation that they were in was, was basically that they all thought they were insured because they'd been paying insurance to the body corporate, but the body corporate itself hadn't actually insured for flood or for overland flow, or it insured for one of the two, and that was that split in the definition thing with the insurance company, so all of these people were done, and none of them had insurance at the end of the day. Um, the top slide there was the difference with um, sort of resilient materials that's come out um, in this, in that the lower slide was all plasterboard, that the, upper sl the top slide there on the, on the right um, can show that, you know, sort of the traditional kind of VJ timbers are kind of more resilient to, to flooding, single skin um, wall systems versus cavity wall systems where mud and debris can get caught, and we'll just kind of keep going through that. So this is going to become a much bigger presentation, obviously, than I am presenting today, but anyway, I'll just m sort of map it out. So we've looked at, we've got data on house type and house age. Um, so most of the houses were detached, but then we had that series in, in Goodner and elsewhere of um, townhouses. Uh, and then we've, we can correlate between the two. So basically what's occurred is that, um, and I think this is the one, the dates of construction, for instance, um, versus type. So the communities, the darker the, um, the colour there, the, the newer the building. So you can sort of see in that kind of tract of land between the Brisbane CBD and the Ipswich CBD <coughs> over time, and that's mainly occurred during the 90s, um, post the 74 flood. That's where the majority of the new um, constructions have occurred. And the majority of them seem to be brick veneer slab on ground construction. Um, you know, the A.V. Jennings style homes, and we can thank A.V. Jennings for a lot of this. Um, so, and these are just the sort of the things that we can sort of, that we've seen. So, big problem was people were cleaning, but they weren't cleaning in the, in the cavities the roof cavities, and, and as Ian mentioned before, the, the trapping of debris in bushfires versus the trapping of debris in, in floods, there, there are a lot of synergies here, so um, we'll kind of keep coming, going through this. Um, so again, we've recorded, and this is part of the whole rigorous research approach to, we didn't just sort of go out and sit with people and discuss, we actually went out and filled out a form which was about nine pages long of a very, very kind of detailed description of the house and the problems associated with it. We even started doing levels of, like heights of inundation above above the ground, um, above floor level and things like that. So you can see there the majority of um, the houses were cleaned, um, but there were still sort of 25% that weren't. Um, the, the roof being sealed, that, this is a big one here actually. So 40, so 20% of the actual, um, houses that we saw had had water above the, the ridge line um, and the majority of them had subsequently had problems with the, with the continued sealing of those roofs and so what we then had, what we then found was that people would resheet and then there'd be more rain and they hadn't actually checked that their roof was sealed properly so they were doubly kind of affected. Um, simple things, buckled flooring that in certain cases, the hardwood timbers would shrink back and actually go back into place. In other situations, um, they wouldn't. Um, composite materials, again, there, are, there was a lot of this sort of stuff that came up. Shifting of structure, which we would then get the engineers out to do. So, and you can see here, the b where was the building dry? And even up to sort of the moment, even now, when we're still doing assessments, there is still quite a high level of moisture content in the timber framing. Um, you can see there that it's off the chart really in terms of none of the houses, well, 10% of the houses were dry and uh, I would imagine that they were the ones that weren't as inundated as others. 
Um, however, people were under pressure to get back into their homes and so um, it di the fact that the, the houses weren't dried didn't actually stop people from resheeting. Um, but the fear is that later on there'll be issues with mould and then therefore allergies and all sorts of things could come from that. So there were still 40 odd out of the 200, so 20% that had their sh structure shifted. Um, things like this, so you can see the cracking of brick veneer, cracking of foundations and slabs, that was another big one. Um, and so that came up time and time again. Um, and we can, I'll just keep going through because I think I'm running out of time again. Um, now we've actually been able to track superficial damage and structural damage. So structural damage was obvious structural damage um, where you could visibly see that the house had been shifted or off its foundations or there was cracking or something like that. Superficial damage, I know it sounds superficial, um, but in terms, that was the actual damage that we could see so that the house that I showed in the, the, the house was just basically that had been um, stripped. That's the sort of idea of the superficial damage in a sense in that um, those, those houses that had been completely kind of wiped out but not structurally. Um, and you can sort of see the inverse here in that as you get lower down on the superficial there's a lot more of the housing that we saw was obviously affected, badly affected um, in terms of linings and wall, like, uh, external, internal and external wall linings, um, um, flooring, etc., etc. Um, and but there weren't that many that had been structurally damaged, although there would have been probably 20% of those, those houses that had been structurally damaged. Now this is where um, I thought it would be, well, it's not right, but we uh, thought it would be good to um, map these occurrences per, by suburb. Um, and then we've, so this is where it actually starts getting quite interesting. So again, superficial damage, there's a lot more in the, the, the brighter yellow. Those are, the, those are the suburbs that, that were affected the most. So Sherwood, Jindalee, Goodna, Borellan Point, Carolee, those kinds of places. Fernvale as well. Um, the next thing was the age of the building versus the damage. And so, for instance, um, in this situation, um, I'm just trying to read out what the colours mean here. It's um, basically the lighter the orange colour, the older and the less affected. The darker the orange, the newer and the more affected. So, for example, Goodner again. Goodner just copped it. Like it was a, it, it was a shocking kind of situation in Goodner, and um, also other places like Carolee, um, um, East Ipswich, North Bouval, those sort of sorts of places out near Ipswich. There, and I must pay tribute to the Ipswich City Council. They comparatively seemed to me to be a lot more on the ball when it came to organising community actions. Um, I think it's just because Brisbane's a lot larger as an organisation, so it's actually a lot, there's a lot more sort of, l there are a lot more layers of things that need to go on to get things happening. Um, so it's, but now stuff is starting to really occur up in Brisbane here, but Ipswich are sort of, they were more ahead of the game at, th at this stage. Um, structural damage by suburb, so Mogul really copped the structural damage and I assume, and it's quite obvious there that um, the confluence of the Brisbane and the Bremer rivers at that point. Um, so the Bremer coming in from the lower left and the, the um, Brisbane River coming in from the, um, the uh, upper left there. And at that point where they're hitting, they're coming together, that's when we saw a lot of structural damage in the houses. Again, around um, also Oxley, where Oxley Creek came through. Um, so age and structural damage there. So again, similar thing to the previous slide where um, the lo lighter the orange, um, older and less damage. The darker the orange, the newer and the more damage. Um, the purple are the newer and then the yellow are the more damage. So um, then what we did was we looked at length of inundation. So, and this was quite an interesting one, which uh, makes perfect sense, but I didn't actually kind of predict that this would necessarily be the outcome. Um, so we all understand topography, I hope, that. Obviously, if you're having a steeper slope, water's running down that hill at a, at a faster rate than it is if it's, if it's a shallower slope. So, for instance, up at Fernvale, the top left um, little patch of blue up the top there, they only had a, an, an inundation of around about 12 hours. So it was a, sort of a quick up and down as the water kind of came down the hill towards Brisbane. Um, but that, that seriously did affect... Um, that, those houses out there were quite affected quite badly because not 
it wasn't necessarily the length of inundation that affected the houses, it was actually the, the how much water was coming through. Um, again, you can see goodness, the darker the, the, darker the actual um, uh, colour, the, the, the longer the time. Uh, so good enough, places like Rock Lee, et cetera, were up around four days, um, and, and then those others in between. So it was dependent on topography and also confluence of rivers and things like that. So um, we looked at inundation versus damage. Um, so again, um, the orange means more damage. So the more orange, the, the worse the damage. Um, the darker, so is is the combination of all the three things like inundation, superficial damage and structural damage. So you can see there that it shows that Goodna was seriously affected. Others like Oxley and also Rock Lee were quite, um, you know, we all know these sorts of things because um, we've been hearing, hearing about them through the media and things like that. So it's sort of proving the point. And, but I, do, I must say, only looking at 200, um, there would be statistical kind of problems with this in the sense that this is just a broad overview. It's not sort of proposing that this is fundamental kind of fact in a sense. So it would need to have a much more kind of rigorous approach to doing something similar to this across a larger scale of houses. Um, but I do think that for, from an indication point of view, it's, it's really good data to kind of be able to inform things. Um, we then looked, this is something that I thought I'd throw in because it became obvious that those who were most affected could least afford it. Um, and so I looked at demographics and we drew this down off um, the Brisbane City Council website and the Ipswich City Council website as to household income per week. So the darker the, the, darker the green, um, the, the less income people have um, by suburb. And you can see sort of places out near Ipswich, Goodna, uh, Rockley, Oxley, those areas um, were heavily, um, those are the areas that have the least income. Um, then we looked at damage. So income levels versus damage. And you can sort of see here, it's quite obvious, the dark, the, the very dark brown colours are those places that um, had a lot of damage and had a very little income. Um, wow. And they're least likely to afford insurance too. Um, and that's what we found. So these are the sorts of things that, um, and now this is just the second last slide. If there was anything that I could pick um, as to one idea that would come out, um, and I'm, I'm not blaming the fact that these things existed because none of us actually could have probably predicted that Wyvernhoe wasn't going to save us this time. And, uh, but one thing that I could see, and this, is, this slide's sort of showing it, is that if we're going to build brick veneer houses, um, let's not do them in floodplains and let's not make them cheap for people who... Um, have kind of no recourse to other kinds of forms of housing. So for instance, somebody, and it was actually uh, somebody in the local, a, a local, I'll say a local councillor, um, had said that they didn't necessarily feel um, uh, sorry for people who hadn't checked flood plans um, before purchasing properties. And because it would be obvious that these sorts of places would flood. Um, However, if you're a single mum with a child and you want a roof over your head and you earn an income of about $40,000 a year, all you can afford and you want to actually enter into the actual market of instead of renting, this is something you'd afford. You would never check this stuff because this is all that's available. And so the point is, I'm not saying we shouldn't necessarily build in floodplains, but I am saying, and similar to what Ian's saying with bushfires, is that the technology and the typologies of housing that we design in our communities here onwards, we can't blame what happened in the past, we should move on, um, but we need to be kind of thinking about what forms of housing we're providing people on low incomes um, and because they are the least, least likely to be able to afford to kind of work through the whole dilemma of a disaster. Um, just, we thought we'd throw this in there. This is a scheme for a, a flood affected house um, that I'm doing at the moment. It's just being lodged for development approval. The blue line there indicates um, the flood, the new flood level. That's where the flood came up to in 2011. Um, and it almost reached the second, the, the ceiling line of the second floor. So we've had to raise the whole house up above um, that level. And 
you end up getting into trouble with scale. But this is where it comes into it. Like it might, it might look um, on face value as quite a... Yeah, that's right. Um, but, but this is sort of something that we're talking about in terms of shifting typologies and, and proposing what things could, how things could be in the future. Um, and this will happen on Graceville Avenue. Um, so, yeah, and this is where Ian and I start. So we uh, colluded on uh, this um, competition, which was set up by the Insurance Council of Australia, and it was recently announced. Uh, we didn't win, unfortunately, but um, the, uh, it was $50,000 prize money, so it was worth a shot. Uh, these are the money shots from our competition entry, and um, <coughs> so you can see in this instance we're dealing with uh, fairly extreme uh, events, and really looking at the, the moments, the, the actual moments that happened. You know, we would have seen in the media a lot of these kind of shots out the helicopter. No, that's what we're actually designing for, those kind of moments of extreme escape and so on, those touch and go kind of um, scenarios. But the most important, most exciting thing for us was just when we first met to just, you know, okay, let's put something into this competition. This revelation that we had, you know, as we kept on going, well, actually, that's the same with bushfires. What's for floods is the same and so on. So, um, yeah, it's, it was really quite exciting to find these these synergies between the, between the, the different things. So, yeah, we're looking at uh, extreme floods, bushfires, cyclones, trying to do that within the one kind of design. Um, and uh, yeah, it's quite, I guess you could say, futuristic, but really, you know, we're looking at this as an idea generating exercise, mm -hmm. rather than a you know, definitive kind of, yeah, we can go and do this tomorrow, even though we did get engineers involved and so yeah. on. So the first one, I'll just start on this one. Um, the basic principle of bushfire, uh, one of them that science has shown, is if you put a house on the ground, you get, as I mentioned before, this incredible um, disparity between pressures. And you get a lot of negative pressure at the base of the building, which attracts embers exactly where you don't want them. So you start fires up around the base of the house. If you elevate the house, you, uh, you actually even out those pressures and you don't get all these embers deposited around the house. So it sounds a bit counterintuitive, but this is like, you know, looking at the research and going, yeah, okay. And of course that makes sense from uh, a lot of other points of view as well, particularly flood, the old thing kind of aside. We could see straight away there was a synergy with, with you know, looking at floods um, and uh, of course, um, when we start thinking about uh, bushfire, um, we've got uh, this elevated structure. Um, but also with cyclones, you have yeah, this massive change in, in pressure. So you elevate the building, you deal with that pressure differentiation. You get it above the ground, you deal with the flood. And you're also dealing with the embers. So the other one we were looking at was, um, was shielding, mm. which is uh, using shielding on the envelope, which is not dissimilar to how a Queenslander deals with airflow, still creating privacy, but having um, the airflow um, still coming through the building, um, equaling out the pressures, dealing with glare and so on. So using shielding to uh, create, the, uh, create the structure. So this is something that came up um, <coughs> time and again when Ian and I were discussing what were the major issues that came out of the EAA assessments and a lot of it was cavity related. So. Um, we thought that in this scheme we would propose, um, well, this is just to show what we're kind of talking about, but there is a lot of inherent kind of knowledge and um, in our kind of building traditions in Queensland here and growing up in um, Rockhampton myself, I, um, it was, it's kind of, um, it's interesting just to sort of see how the population of Brisbane dealt with floods versus how the population of Rockhampton deals with floods and it's something that as a child we just kind of got used to um, because th in those areas where it floods, the houses are actually tall and they're above the ground and people don't generally build in underneath them um, because they're aware that every couple of years it's going to flood because it does flood there more often than it does flood here and it's a lower lying area. So um, you know, there is a, and this is something we were just trying to communicate, was um, debris and mud is caught in cavities just like in fire with um, embers and things like that. So, um, and this is something that's close to Ian's heart. Yeah, so just to build upon that other one, like what Dave <coughs> was getting across before, like a lot of the water and moisture that we just caught in those walls, and so the damage is happening long after the flood is gone. Mm. It's the same with houses. I mean, houses have been known to burn down in six days after the bushfire has come through because of that retained mm -hmm. heat that might be in flooding some of the structures around. So you've got this incredible lag that's not often thought about. It's always thought of, well, there's the extreme event, and that the actual damage happened during that event. It's not necessarily the case at all. So, um, and getting back to that idea of the, the disaster safe zone, looking at human behaviour, where do we want to be? Where do they want to be in any of these events? 
because they want to be in the place where they can excel the most. And that's on the work balance. So we've always been there and probably the biggest fan of the work balance in the firms and in the firm. But it's not the fact of having more firms, it's that they want to work in the firms. We're, mm. we're a surveillance um, kind of uh, company. So uh, a fire compartment, a flood compartment with uh, flood-proof doors, gives you this two-hour time lag. Uh, the water might be still rising. So it's about, obviously you don't want to be where the disaster is, but we know from experience that people don't often have that chance to do that. You know, these things just swamp you, literally. So um, having all this accommodation within this, this fire compartment, dealing with those um, equalizing pressures, it's kind of a, a high-tech kind of thing from a fire view. Just even in the, fl in the plan form, we were, we were kind of playing with um, the idea of, um, and I mean, again, the, the principles are the interesting thing about this scheme. It's not necessarily that we're proposing this as the prototype for the new house, Australian house or anything like that. It was just how do you represent in the architect architectural form the, the problems that do come about through floods, fire and, and cyclone and, and having that form kind of represent um, and reflect. So that what we were showing here was that corners of buildings is in plan are perfect spots for moisture to collect and also for debris and, and um, embers in fires. So if you don't have definitive kind of uh, right angled corners, then um, you can kind of uh, prevent this, these things from happening. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. And just some detailing in terms of, um, well it's not showing up, it might be a bit blown out because I can see it here, but up the top there we're just talking, we we're even proposing kind of different materials for um, how you could effectively get um, high insulation, thermal insulation into kind of single skin walls and things without needing a cavity. Um, and then these are just sort of some of the, the kind of general diagrams of the house um, and showing the red box there as being the, the thing in this scheme which was the, the fire compartment and the flood compartment um, leading up to the roof of the house for people to jump onto a helicopter. So these are all drawings from our submission mm. for the competition and uh, there were certain constraints. It had to be the ratio of 10% uh, slope in the topography and This is the competition winning scheme. Um, so what we're saying is that um, you've got to <laughs> push things a lot more than just the conventions. Because whilst that thing we flashed up just on the last slide might satisfy um, <laughs> some of that. Um, we'll just keep moving on that one. Well, it might deal with things like maintenance. It's all made out of steel. It was a submission by Blue Cross Steel. steel. Uh, I don't know why they needed the 50,000 anyway. Um, the, um, but it does absolutely nothing for architecture. So architects, as we said at the start, we work in both directions. We're trying to actually work with society. Going to be more so than myself because we're working with the architecture community in this way. Um, but we're really also, in, at exactly the same time, trying to further the discipline of architecture, trying to move that forward. And the machine is a working out of architects here. And so the call is a call to action to, to you know, all architecture involves research, but to what extent are you really trying to further, um, you know, the discipline itself. That's it. Yep. Uh, we're going to take questions. Um, could I ask that you wait until some kind soul delivers a microphone to you? Because you are being recorded. So the first question here in the third row. you try to make your questions brief, please? Thank, thanks, Ian. You know how Rockhampton is in the, the trop... No, Ian, I think we... Yeah, Ian and James. <laughs> when, when, you, when you're designing and that, are you thinking about the potential of long-term heat waves as we confront the challenges of climate change? Um, heat waves could actually go anti some of those design principles because we actually might need to get people into ventilation to prevent dehydration and therefore closing up and keeping those sort of windows closed mm -hmm. might be the way to cook people. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, well, the answer to that is houses that perform rather than just are forming. I mean, it sounds like a catchphrase, and I guess it is, but the house that I showed with the shutters, those clients have to operate those shutters every day just to keep plants warm in the house. 
And uh, so, yeah, that's a bit of an impost on their um, you know, daily life. But that's the issue, making these things part of their daily life and, and their habits um, so that when an extreme event comes along, they know what to do. Like to deploy the shuttles where they just did that half an hour ago when the storm still came. So it's about actually, um, I guess, dynamic kind of structures rather than structures that are always just trying to be one thing. So it's, it's actually putting more onus on the inhabitants to you know, do more work effectively to adjust to building. So that, that's probably the, the most effective way of, of dealing with, with, I guess, future events is obviously adaptation is a key word and you need to be able to do that with your, with your inhabitations, get them to adapt. Would you mind sitting on this in camera thing? So there was a question here in the front, and maybe this is the microphone. Down. Two questions, I suppose. First of all, I was staggered to find how recently so much of the flooded uh, uh, real estate had been built. Um, are we planning for the future by? Uh, seeking to restrict subdivision of flood-prone land further out? That's one question. The other question, you had a line on your, um, your house saying uh, this was the level of the 2011 flood. Now, uh, <coughs> I was here in the 74 floods, and I think they were significantly higher uh, by the best part of two metres. Yep. And the 89 flood, uh, the, eight 80 the, the 1890 floods were higher again. So of the four floods that Brisbane has had in its history, why have we chosen the lowest one as our guideline in terms of avoiding inundation? Um, so, um, it's on. so I had this, I had an actual argument with the, at the, in the pre-lodgement meeting with the council. <laughs> um, I had an argument with the pr uh, with council in the pre-lodgement meeting about this very point because they've um, said that all habitable rooms must be 500 millimetres above the current 2011 flood levels. Um, but the point I made was that 1893 was even bigger and it came down the Bremer River rather than the Brisbane River. And so Wyvernhoe doesn't help the Bremer River at all. So um, it's highly likely that we'll get another flood that's bigger um, and possibly within our lifespan. So what I proposed and is to go beyond the level of the, the current flood line. Um, and the response was that you could do that. Um, it's just that the, the flood, the 500 millimetres above the current flood level is just a minimum. And if you can prove that your house doesn't impact negatively on your neighbours, on the neighbours and things like that, then they'll allow you to go higher. And the problem is we end up getting paddle steamers, and that's the problem on that, that house that I showed, um, is that we end up sort of getting, this house alone is going to be, I think, 13 metres above ground level at, the, at its pitch, at the top of its um, ridge line, um, which is, uh, which was quite a hard thing to deal with in terms of stairs and, uh, and getting it onto a small lot, which, it, which it's on, and so that it's a complex si kind of situation, and um, I'm not necessarily happy completely with it, but that's, I don't think as architects we ever are. Um, but in terms of getting my clients, so they're an extra, uh, I think they're more than a metre above the 2011 level. And that was done deliberately because all the flood, during the flood event, things were predicted to go a metre higher. So I thought, well, at least get people up that high. And everyone knows, like my clients are fully aware that it's going to flood again. Like they are, it's all about resilient materials and being able to kind of even wash the house out easily now that there's a flood that has occurred. So if it does occur again, they don't have to go through the same problems that they went through this time. And so the, the design is sort of taking into consideration um, cleaning, you know, at the end of the day and things. So you're right, I, it, it's a problem. And back to your first question about do we restrict construction in those sorts of flood prone areas? I mean, um, I'm not so sure we need to restrict things. I just think we need to, as thinkers, um, put some more rigorous thinking into it. And so, um, and I'm not necessarily the person that can do this. I'm, I'm just presenting this. Um, but 
there are a lot of really intelligent people out there that could actually answer a lot of these questions and um, I'm not necessarily so sure that they get a chance to have a voice. And so, uh, yeah, my, my interest would be in how do you work with rather than just reject. Like that sort of, maybe it's my personal thing. But thanks for your question. It was a great talk. There's no doubt that uh, innovative thinkers uh, still got to get out of the box. Um, Ian, the question is the 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 fire retarded room. Yes. So did you get in and light the house? How does it work <laughs> for the two hours, please? On the same principles as in a high rise building. So um, the house that I'm designing at the moment in the forest will have a completely structurally decoupled room, even though it looks like it's attached to the in plan. Um, it's actually there's no way that if the structure is burning, then that there will be structural failure that will affect that room. So that's the first principle. So it stands alone. It's actually built up from the ground and the house is almost built around it in a U shape. Um, and then you get down to the details of what the actual materials are and ventilation and so on. So two hour fire rated concrete and insulation and so on. It's two hours enough, is it? Well, um, it's but what we're, again, it sort of goes back to what I was saying at the start. It's about prioritising. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what we're saying in that landscape is that um, there's a, the, there's a high probability that there will be a fire that will be through the low-lying vegetation um, and there's a low probability that a fire will actually get into the crowns of the trees and, you know, it's not really designed for that situation because Black Saturday, anecdotes from people that experienced that, they were fighting fires for like 24 hours. They were no, defending their house for like 24 hours. That was a different fire anyway and it was a lot more intense than most people realise. Well, it was the kind of fire where you had, yeah, Every every aspect of the of the vegetation was actually on fire. Can I um, ask about the timber under the floor? You said that the fire goes under the floor. That's so right. Well, the embers. Yep. Certainly, you know the air will the embers won't get trapped around the perimeter of the house. So is that a special type of timber? Is it silicon based or? No. Well, the, the this house is all timber structure except for the the steel uh, posts and so on. And this this house is nowhere near the kind of fire. Um, behaviour as Black Saturday, so they're very quick fires, like five okay. minutes, literally, that's, this, this landscape was, that's all trees burning back from, uh, uh, growing back from the last fire that you're seeing in the horizon of that photograph. Um, so really quick fires, and they've been happening for a hundred years, um, they, they've been measured for a hundred years. So we know that they're really quick, um, and you know, they're quite intense, but they're quick, and that means that house can look like that, other than the house I'm doing, say, in the forest, completely different type. What I meant is you're using uh, fire retarded timber. Well, we're using a treatment on the decks, yeah, um, but the reason why it's timber is because it's close to the coast and we can't use steel for the structure because it would corrode. So that was, that's this prioritising thing. You'd Are they using silica-based timber here? Really happy to come back to you in a minute. Can we make that the last one? If, but yeah, please address the question. The timber is chosen mainly for um, the corrosive um, extremes of the environment. Um, and it's shielded with fibre cement sheet to actually stop it being you know, exposed directly to flame and so on. Yep, there was a question, I think, here. I'll come back to you if there's, if there's an opportunity. I was just really going to ask a question about materials. Uh, <laughs> the uh, flood houses that you showed, uh, the modern houses that had uh, basically gutters, um, should we rebuild those in... Uh, plasterboard or should we be looking at alternative materials? Is there, should we be giving some thought to uh, trying to protect those people in, in those sorts of situations in the future against future flood or do we just take a right of principle and say, well, it'll flood again, we'll use plasterboard and keep them afloat? Um, if I think about Goodna in, that, in answering that, um, then at the moment, seems to be the cheapest material out there for the front door. And uh, the problem is, I think, uh, however, if I was to re, like if we were to knock that whole thing down and rebuild it, the whole typology of the house wouldn't be a slab on ground with veneer house. Um, so I do think that there needs to be a shift in government, um, the authority kind of, legislation and rules in, in terms of these areas, the sort of the, the overall 
local area plans for what you can and can't build and for inundation and materials. And um, I, I do think it needs to come down to that that sort of level of detail. Um, but for those those guys in, like we had people in in Goodna resheeting within two weeks because they didn't have anywhere else to live. And you know, um, whereas others were sort of one was living in a caravan park up at Bribie Island. And the children were elsewhere, kind of a thing, and it was sort of a. So th these are dramatic situations. So the planning from now, I think, is when. So that's why I said, like, we can let's move on. We can, if people want to do, what, they'll do what they want to do anyway. This is the thing. We weren't. We could never have gone out, and it wasn't our intention was to, to go out and actually say, do not resheet. Your timbers are too, too wet. Um, it's. But we did say your timbers are too wet. We advise you don't resheet. However. It's up to you at the end of the day if you do or don't. And the guys were there doing it as we were talking to them, you know. Like <laughs> it was and and I would be too. Like I would be too. If I had my children and they were affected negatively like that and there's a lot of stress and there's a lot of emotion, um, you know, you can't stop people from like or, or we would become dictators, you know. It's sort of a but you can inform them at least that what they're entering into is a difficult situation in the future. So, and I doubt that, that those townhouses will get insurance for flooding, you know, like they just won't. So they'll all be uninsured um, from now on, I think. There's a question here in the room. Um, hi, I'd, I'd like to think we're talking more, is this on? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to think we're talking more about flood resi resilience than flood proofing flood proofing implies that we have some kind of control over natural mm -hmm. disasters which we don't and many people whilst many people were affected there are many people that were very lucky in the last flood um, so there'd be a lot of people thinking about how can they retrofit their dwelling so they can be more resilient to fire if that's a risk or a flood mm. yeah there's a situation i've got at the moment with a client um uh, near orley park and um while their house, the land was flooded, but the house wasn't. But they're now thinking, and so they've approached me to sort of work on that. And it's an interesting um, situation. Like I, you know, a year ago, I would never have expected that I'd be sort of doing this sort of thing. But it, it from my own knowledge, it's um, and and testing of things. Um, you know, it's. I think you're right. Like resilience is the key. Like definitely, it's it's got to be. It can't be proof. It's not. But but resilience would be a good thing for making life easier when these things do happen to kind of other people. So yeah. 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 Yeah.